Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. We continue our series on country music and faith with guests who have secured their place as country music legends, Marty Rabin and Mike McGuire from the country supergroup Shenandoah and legendary vocalist Gene Watson. Marty Rabin is the lead singer and Mike McGuire is the drummer for Grammy Award winning and CMA Award winning group Shenandoah. They share about the beginnings of their band and how grateful they are to God to be able to bring music to the world for over 30 years. I'm Marty Raven. Uh, I sing lead for the group Shenandoah. Uh, and I'm, I'm married to a woman that I literally truly believe without a shadow of a doubt. I'm, I'm more desperately in love with uh, today than I was the day that I married her. Uh, we have uh, uh, three boys, hairy-legged boys. Their feet stink and everything. I mean, they just... <laughs> And, uh, Take after their daddy. Uh, Michael, Matthew, and Maxwell, and I, I wouldn't give anything in the world for it. And I also have uh, two grand boys myself, uh, Micah and Jameson. And uh, I, the Lord has truly blessed my house. I'm Mike McGuire. I'm the drummer from Shenandoah. We uh, started this thing 30-some-odd years ago and uh, been playing drums with this band uh, the whole time. And first band and only band I've ever been in. Uh, I'm a husband. I'm a... Dad, I'm a uh, brand new grandfather to a little three month old uh, boy called uh, Oakland. And he's, uh, boy, howdy, he's, uh, he's a, a pride and joy right now in our family. My dad was a, a Baptist minister, you know. Uh, we were raised up in church. We were one of those kind of families that uh, we were in church every time the doors were open Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday too. You know, uh, Wednesdays were always uh, Bible study, I remember that, and uh, Sunday school. You know, we, uh, we were raised uh, the right way. You know, I'm thankful for the, uh, the, the parents that the good Lord chose for me to be raised by. And uh, you know, my dad was good as gold. He's, uh, he's been gone now for several years. He died of Alzheimer's. And uh, we miss, I miss my daddy every day. We still got my mother, and uh, she's in, uh, for her age, she's in great health. She can still drive a car. She's 87 years old, I think. And uh, she can still drive a car and, and uh, Still lives in the same house that uh, I was raised up in, you know. And uh, my, uh, I tell people sometimes, you know, my my upbringing was as close to, to Leave It to Beaver and and Andy Griffith as uh, as you could hope for. I grew up in a home that uh, my dad and mom divorced when I was six. There were five of us. Uh, I, I was third in the family of five, and therefore I I, I understood quite a bit of you know what uh, my older brother and my older sister realized and, and in a lot of ways is as ignorant about things that was going on in our life at the time as my younger brother and younger sister and, and uh, you know uh, it, it wasn't one of those situations where it was a where it was a bad divorce or anything like that and 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 the one thing that I can say is is that I, I never heard my mother ever say one ugly thing about my father and uh, I, I, I never heard my daddy ever say an ugly word about my mother. In fact, even to the point, you know, the older we got, you know, we, why did y'all ever divorce? Why? And, uh, you know, and, and to this day, uh, myself nor any, do any of my siblings even know the reason. But 17 years after they divorced, they remarried. And, uh, you know, so therefore growing up in a home uh, that, that, that seemed somewhat scattered and tattered and stuff like that, th there truly was always the belief that, that there was a God and that, uh, that there was a, a son and his name was Jesus. I have literally learned to love him and to know him. And uh, uh, not just to the point of, of realizing that on March 15th, 1991, I staked my eternity on him, but have had him since that day realizing that, that my salvation has been intact from the day that God saved my wretched soul. I realized that uh, for 31 years, what I was doing wasn't working. It just wasn't working. And, uh, and I, I, I'm grateful to the Lord that that, you know, that I even realized that. You know, one, one of the greatest things in the world that I think that I, I, I've been able to, or, or have tried to, to comprehend more than anything else in the world is to realize that, 
that as the apostle Paul said that 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 God truly is willing uh, to work with us and to love on us to overlook our fault to meet our need the way the band got started uh, back in uh, golly we actually before Marty even joined the band there were uh, it was me Jim Sells Stan Thorne you know the three of us were part of Shenandoah but there was a different lead singer and a bass player uh, and we worked together at a nightclub down in Muscle Shoals Alabama and uh, the lead singer and bass player got fired and we were looking for a, a lead singer. Well Marty had uh, become friends with my brother up here in Nashville and so I'd gotten to know Marty over about a year a year time I guess. I'd make trips all the time from Muscle Shows to Nashville uh, when we were, weren't playing at the club. But anyway when we lost our lead singer they called Marty and offered him a job you know to come to Muscle Shows not thinking anything about a record deal that was you know never in those days that was never part of my thinking and uh, it was just hiring a lead singer to come work with us at the club. So he took the job, moved down to Muscle Shoals, and moved into my apartment with me. And we worked at the club at night, but during the daytime, there was a recording studio there called Fame Recording Studio. There was a guy named Robert Byrne that was a songwriter there with Rick. And just in passing one day at the studio, I said, man, you should come here and play one night at the club, Robert. And so he shows up at the club and hears us one night and, and uh, tells us about this, uh, this deal that Rick Hall had put together with CBS. They were looking for a band. Yeah, a production deal. Yeah, it was a production deal. And so they had this, uh, this deal with uh, Rick Blackburn at CBS and they were looking for a band. So Robert, uh, a songwriter named uh, Walt Aldridge, Tommy Brassfield, Mac McAnally, and I believe Steve Nathan, all were, uh, they were all supposed to go find a band to produce. And yeah. Robert, we didn't even know about this even though we were at the studio every day, but uh, Robert said, man, I've been all over the country looking for a band to produce. I can't believe right here in my own backyard. I want to use my slot on you guys. So we cut six songs and uh, he invited Rick to co-produce the project with him, which, you know, and I, I man, I tripped, this was a God thing. When they took our project to CBS to play to the record label head, they also took a, a, one of the other guys' projects too. Played both of them in the same meeting and Robert told us, that the record label liked the other band, but didn't really hear anything in us. And he said, Rick Hall said, well, if you want these other guys, you're gonna have to take these guys too. And they said, we don't want two bands, Rick. This whole thing has always been about, you know, one new band. He said, well, I don't care. If you want those guys, you gotta take my guys too. So they signed us on a, well, okay, whatever. So they signed us. I can look uh, back through our career and see where, you know, God shoot us this way instead of that way. And that's where that's how we ended up where we are. You know, when when we first got a got a record deal, uh, you know, a couple of the guys in the band wasn't really interested. You know, uh, of course they had families and stuff like that, and and of course they had studio work, and they also were, you know, songwriters as well. And and uh, the little club work that that we were doing, uh, you know, it, it, it sufficed you know, what their need was monetarily, so therefore they they didn't have to go anywhere, they didn't have to do anything other than, than the routine and the pattern that they were in with the family. And and so a couple of guys said no, and I said, man, look, I, man, I left Florida in 84, you know, to, to get a record deal. And I said, man, I, I'm in. And uh, of course, Mike said he was in, so did Stan Thorne, uh, uh, the piano player. So then the next thing you know, I, I mean, everybody was on board and, and to realize that that not only, you know, had we uh, uh, recorded some music, but then all of a sudden we started seeing it work across the country. And uh, bam, it, you know, from a, a couple, two or three records that, you know, the first record we had, you know, it anchored out at 58. Uh, the second single that we had, uh, Stop the Rain, it went to 28 and bombed. And so there was that kind of, well, you know, is this gonna work or not? And then all of a sudden we came with a, with a tune that Robert Byrne and Will Robbins had, had written and uh, uh, called She Doesn't Cry Anymore. And uh, it went to number nine. So that happened to be our first top 10 record. And, and from there, Mama Knows followed that up. Uh, from Mama Knows, it, it turned into Church on Cumberland Road which wound up being our first number one record. I mean, it was surreal having a hit on the radio. The first couple of singles that we had out, to, to be honest with you, when we first got the record deal, it, it was just so surreal that we had a, had a record deal, you know, and, and the, the thought of us having a hit on the radio was so foreign to me. I mean, we're just regular old, we're just a bunch of dumb country boys, you know, and 
And to, to get a record deal was surreal enough in and of itself. But the first couple of singles came out and they didn't really do much, but they did about what we thought they'd do. Not much, you know. But then, uh, then like Marty said, She Doesn't Cry Anymore went to number nine with hardly any record promotion. And, uh, but boy, when, when it went to number nine, that's the record label changed gears and they started putting money behind us. And they sent us out to California and those people out there mouthing the words to everything we're singing. That, that's the first time I realized how powerful uh, radio is, country radio. You know, they're playing country music out in California just like they do in Tennessee or Alabama or Texas, you know. And uh, it, uh, surreal is the only word I can think of to describe what the feeling was like to have, you know, have hits. You know, I Want to Be Loved Like That is one of those kind of songs that that literally lends itself because of what the three different scenarios and the verses speak of. And it all comes back to love and compassion and, and literally the willingness to go on although someone's passed. That, that, that love doesn't die. And although Christ uh, was, was dead and laid in the tomb, it's because of that resurrection we also too may live. And so therefore that, that continues on. And you know, it's just, it's one of those kind of songs that, that, uh, that from the very, very first time that people heard it when we, when we first recorded it and we started doing it live, I mean, the chorus was just so sing-songy. And, and the simplicity of what the chorus was, it just lent itself uh, for people to sing it. And, and what we were finding was that people would listen to the, the verse but when the chorus came around, they'd start singing the chorus. And then we started noticing that, oh, okay, well, it's been played enough. Now they know all the, you know, now, you know, now they'll mouth the words to you and sing with you, you know, when you do the, the verses as well. But from the very, very get-go, it was always that chorus that would speak to people. And uh, because it, 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 it truly is a song that, that really puts you in the place of peace and ease and uh, uh, somebody said, well, man, you know, man, it's just a great song. And it makes great for, for having it in a show to be able to, uh, to exploit it for what it is. And the only way in the world that I could see it, you know, see it exploited the way, any other way than it could be was to allow folks to realize literally how much the love of God and, and, and to realize how much God loves them. You know, that, that he's literally willing to do whatever it takes to come and to meet you. Not only to give you what he wants to give you, but he'll come and meet you at that place. One of the best ways in the world to ever really get charged up is to be able to take that time in the morning. And, and, and you know, it, and I, I'm going to say this, and I know this sounds, well, you know, I ain't trying to act holier than that. When I get up in the morning, when I open my eyes, I just say, Lord, thank you. I, I praise your name, Lord God. Some, somehow or another, some way today, Lord God, use me. Do something that, 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 that you could do through me today. Just use me, Lord. You know, a devotional is an absolutely wonderful way in which to do that. Because although you don't have a time for a study, you know, you, you, you could read John uh, 6, 12 through 13 in the text. You can turn around, well, you know, I, I can read them two verses. But, you know, you read what the uh, what the take uh, of somebody that has written it. And, and, you, and you, you know, it kind of, it, it allows you to kind of get your understanding in gear of, okay, well, that's the way they took it. The wonderful thing about the Word of God is, is although that may generate you, you know, to read something and, and, and to literally have that positive and, and that, that pleasant understanding of knowing that, that not only is God in control, for the rest of the day He's going to lead, but it, it allows you to, to realize that, that the Word of God is living. Shenandoah has released their first new album in nearly 20 years called Reloaded. Marty and Mike talk a little about the record and their excitement about bringing new music to their fans. The album that's uh, that's coming out on the 26th of next month uh, in uh, March is uh, titled Reloaded, of course. And uh, the way this whole thing started, Jay DeMarcus from Rascal Flats called me one day out of the blue. 
and had heard that Marty had rejoined the band, which he just had just a few months earlier. He'd been gone for 17 years. And uh, I told Jay, yeah, that's true, man. Marty, Marty's back. And he said, look, man, we're huge fans of you guys. The first song we ever sang together was Church on Cumberland Road, our first uh, number one record. And he said, I'd love to take you guys in the studio and record some new music and see if we can't get a record deal. So we, uh, we came up to Nashville with Jay over to ASCAP, spent two days listening for songs, you know, and uh, narrowed it down to, to five songs. And they took it over to BMG, and BMG loved it. But we were extremely excited. It's the first uh, country album we'd had out in 20 years. First time we had a song on the charts in at least that long. So, You know, we still, Honest and Trudy had a lot to say. And, you know, we're, we're, in, we're in good health, thank the Lord. Uh, we still absolutely love what we do. Uh, we, we truly love people. And... To be able to do that and to be able to have a run at this thing and, and actually to have a run at it where, where we literally have no walls to tell us, you know, what you can do and what you can't. You know, this is a good idea. That's not a good idea. You know, that kind of stuff. We, we actually have a lot of freedom and a lot of liberty to do it. And therefore, being able to do th this new album, you know, that's all of that is what makes it so exciting to be able to do it. To find out more about Shenandoah's new record, Reloaded, please visit Shenandoah.com. We'll be back after this brief message about a free offer from Jesus Calling. Want a daily reminder that we can have hope, peace, and joy each day in Jesus? Now it's as easy as opening an email. The Jesus Calling Daily Email brings you a thought from the Jesus Calling family of devotionals every day. Brighten up your inbox with this little reminder and take a minute to connect with God during your day. To sign up to get your free daily thought from Jesus Calling, please visit jesuscalling.com slash daily dash email. That's jesuscalling.com slash daily dash email. Our next guest is recognized in country music circles as a singer's singer and is known for his masterful vocals. Gene Watson has endured the ups and downs of the music business to become a country music legend. After releasing his very first single in 1962, Watson is still touring constantly in the USA and abroad and remains proud to be known as an icon for real country. He reflects with us now on his childhood, how he developed his love for music, and the faith that has sustained him over a 50-year career. I'm Gene Watson, and uh, you know, as far as back as far back as I can remember, uh, church has always been a part of my life. I was raised poor, as poor as, as, as it can get. But if you've never had anything, you don't really miss it, you know. So. Uh, when we got to stop on the road and drank a Coca-Cola or something, boy, that was a treat for us. We thought that was great, you know, uh, because I, I come from a family with, you know, uh, meager, meager means, you know what I mean? And, and it, it was not easy. It's never been too easy for me personally. Uh, I was born crippled, and uh, a doctor said I'd never walk. But my mother said, yes, he will, you know, and, and, and she prayed for me and she would rub and massage my feet. My feet were turned up against my legs. My toes were touching my, like my shin. And she worked and massaged, worked and massaged. And, and uh, when I got old enough, well, she put me down on the floor and crawling came first. Next thing you know, I was walking enough to until, of course, I can walk now. So I, I have all the faith in the world that miracles can happen. I was raised that way. We lived for a, a time in a school bus because my dad went from crop to crop. We would go pull radishes, we'd cut lettuce, we'd dig potatoes, whatever, to get by, you know? But my dad's faith was so strong, and he knew that he was the breadwinner. He had to make a living. And, and, and one of his sayings was one that I'll never forget and I love to live by. When he'd leave the house in the morning, he'd say, well, I'm going out there and uh, if there's a dollar, I'm gonna get half of it, you know? And uh, that's, that, that was what kept us going. So I'm, I feel extremely fortunate and blessed 
you know, for everything that I have, I feel like any good thing that I've got or that's happened to me came through my mother's prayers and from the good Lord above. I believe that with all my heart. Music was a large part of, of my upbringing, my church and everything. And as far back as I can remember talking, I can remember singing in church. And as far as the faith goes, I think the, the love for music was born, you know, when I was, and, and not only me, every member of my family were singers. And, uh, and even living in school bus, you know, we'd be going down the road singing, boy, just having a great time. But it was, uh, it was gospel music and all that. And of course, back then, you could hear the top 10 if you had a radio on the radio, the top 10. And I, boy, I had my ear always stuck to that radio. And I love music so much that if I ever heard a song twice, I knew it. Of course, my mom and dad uh, were singers. And I, I tell everybody that I'm the only one that took it up professionally. And, and, and I'm probably not even the best singer in the family. But uh, I was the only one crazy enough to go at it as a profession. You know, I, I never had planned on being a, an entertainer. That was the furthest thing from my mind. I thought that was so out of you know, the, the realm of what I would grow up to do because music like that was something you heard on the radio and I didn't ever figure I'd be on the radio. So I was content to work on cars, but, but I was singing too. A couple of guys heard me and asked me would I like to do some recording and I thought they, they were fooling around with me then, but they brought me to Nashville. And, and so my career has been, through my eyes, an accident. I'm sure it was all pre-planned by our maker. And so, Things just kind of, you know, evolved as to where I am now. And when I made up my mind to go out on the road full time, that was a step that I was really reluctant to make because, like I say, I wasn't sure that I could make it in the music business. And I knew how to work on cars. So I took my tools and rolled them up in the garage. And I said, well, I'm going to try as hard as I can to make it in the music business. But if it don't work, I can come back and work on cars. And uh, I've been on the road ever since. So good Lord's been good to me. M music's been good to me, but I, I, never, I never have anything that I consider good or great happen to me that I don't give the thanks to the good Lord above. I come from a family to where, you know, faith was everything. I think my mother might have you know, instilled that into me. And I still believe that more than anything. If you've got the faith, uh, you know, that that's everything. And I know this through many, many times that have uh, came and gone. For instance, in 2000, I was diagnosed with cancer, you know, and, and uh, it was not a surprise that I had it, but I felt like if I had enough faith that I could beat it, and and I never gave up. I never gave in. I never thought about losing the fight. I always had faith that 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 I could do it. And it wasn't easy to do because I lost my mom from cancer, lost my dad from cancer, I lost my older brother from cancer, and my older sister from cancer. All of them cancer, and then I had cancer. I'm a believer in faith. You know what it says about the faith of a mustard seed, and you can move mountains. And uh, I certainly have that much faith. Uh, and no matter what comes or goes, what happens to me, I figure it was for a reason. And I know who controls what happens. Uh, I, just, I just strive to do what's right the best I can. A lot of people look at it in a lot of different ways. A lot of people, you know, before they go to bed at night, get down on their knees and pray. You know, I think that's a great thing. Every day that rolls around, you know, I visit with him, you know what I mean? And, and in a lot of different ways. There's a lot of times I'll be driving down the road and just, just out loud say, thank you, God, you know? Not for one thing, for everything. For everything that he's allowed me to be, to do, to become, you know? I know the good man hears me when I talk to him, and I talk to him every day. I think it's, I think it's a silent time, and I don't think there's many times of the day that, uh, that I don't spend with him, you know? Uh, he's the way, the truth, and life, you know? 
He gives me the strength to sing. And, and that's all you can ask for. Gene decided to go back to the music he first started singing as a boy and has recently recorded a gospel record entitled My Gospel Roots. He talks about a special song on that record that he dedicated to his parents and why it touched his heart. I could do just about any type of song that I wanted to because my life was just full of music. But as far as being heard to where people were really paying attention to me, it, it all goes back to church. The song that was brought to me by a good friend, Dave Lindsay, who handles my publishing and everything, he come across this song and he brought it to me and he said, Gene said, I'd, I'd like you to listen to this song. He said, man, this could be a great gospel song. And uh, so I listened at it and I thought, wow. I had never heard a gospel song written from that perspective, you know? Uh, because, you know, the good Lord died on the cross and he was, you know, crucified by the Romans, you know, the soldiers and all that. They pierced his side, all this stuff, you know. Well, that was to save me and you, you know, and everything. And so I'm one of the Roman soldiers that he died for, you know. I'm the one that pierced his side. I sit at the foot of the tree, you know. And it, I get chill bumps right now thinking about it. And, and I thought, my goodness, what a song, you know. And, and through it all, it tells about Jesus said, Father, forgive them. And he was looking down on me. I'm an old Roman soldier. I sit at the foot of the tree. And it just meant so much to me. It just really touched that spot. I'm an old Roman soldier. I stood at My dad would play guitar and, and him and mom would stand up there and sing these songs and everything that I was raised on. And, and I recorded, there's some of them in that album, Swing Wide Them Golden Gates, I'm Gonna Come Sweeping Through. And I can visualize my mom and dad standing up there singing that song right now. And, and, and I just, I thought, you know, mother used to take me and my brothers and sisters and say, look here now, this song goes like this. The harmony goes here, goes there, goes here, goes. And we all sung different parts and everything. And some of the songs would have after time in it, you know, that somebody had to do. And me and mom was about the only ones, you know, that would attempt that. But, but uh, it just all came back to my head and was just swirling, you know, and it, it meant so much to me. Uh, I know that, that, that mom's looking down on me right now, you know, proud that I, that I recorded this album. To find out more about Gene Watson's gospel record, My Gospel Roots, please visit genewatsonmusic.com. If you have plans to be in Nashville, Tennessee for the CMA Music Fest June 7th through 10th, please visit us at the Jesus Calling booth in the Fanfare X area at booth 106. We'll have some of the artists you've heard on this podcast there to meet and greet visitors. And if you can't make it, be sure to check us out on Facebook Live as we talk to these artists at the show. This week's passage comes from the June 6th entry of the Jesus Calling audiobook. Seek my face, and you will find fulfillment of your deepest longings. My world is filled with beautiful things. They are meant to be pointers to me, reminders of my abiding presence. The earth still declares my glory to those who have eyes that see and ears that hear. You had a darkened mind before you sought me wholeheartedly. I chose to pour my light into you so that you can be a beacon to others. There is no room for pride in this position. Your part is to reflect my glory. I am the Lord. Do you love hearing great stories of faith each week via the Jesus Calling podcast? We want to hear from you. If you haven't already subscribed to the Jesus Calling podcast, visit the Jesus Calling page at iTunes.com and hit the subscribe button. While you're there, we'd love for you to leave us a review and tell us how you feel about the show and what future guests you'd love to see. Your reviews and subscription help us share these stories of faith to more people who need the hope and encouragement of Jesus Calling. If you have your own story to share, we'd love to hear from you. Visit JesusCalling.com to share your story today.